Wow, nice crowd. Hi, guys. Hi. I'm so excited to be here. This is like kind of hometown crowd close, you know. I grew up in Stanton. Went to Central Macomb, which is crazy. So a lot of times I'm talking to people and they don't have any frame of reference from Michigan. Like, you know, how many of you guys like to hunt and fish and be in the woods? Pretty much everybody. Hunting, camping, fishing. And so how many of you think you can get lost in Michigan? You ever been to the UP? <laughs> There's even places around here, if you get into the national and state forests and places, it's definitely possible to get lost. And tonight I'm just kind of, I want to put you in a survival situation. And I want to go over some tactics, some thoughts, some strategies, talk about some gear, because I think we take it for granted that you're never going to get lost. And then when it happens, a few small things can make a big, big difference. And I'm going to jump right in that. We're going to talk about my TV stuff too, but right now it's the survival situation. Does everybody have a piece of paper and a pen? If you guys are just joining us, you need a piece of paper and a pencil. And I think they might be, I think she can bring them around to you. I'm going to put you in a survival situation. I, I, I was thinking about this on the way here. Um, Lots of places in Michigan you could get turned around, but I'm going to put you in a plane, and it just went down. You're in a small aircraft. You're in, like, Boundary Waters area of northern Minnesota. You were going to go on a canoeing trip, and now you're in the north woods. The plane, you don't know if it's going to burst into flames or not. There's some smoke coming out, but you're alive. There's a couple other people who are with you. They may or may not be injured. They're alive at the moment, too. But you're concerned that this plane might catch on fire. So you've got to get out. Now, you see a survival bag in the plane because every pilot in remote areas carries stuff like this. The pilot is dead. What are you going to do? you got to get out of the plane, and you know that there's a bag in here with some stuff that's going to be useful to you. What I want you to do is I pull these things out, and I'm not going to comment on all, any of them. I'm just going to pull them out and let you think on it, and then we'll give you time to think. I want you to have three things that you're going to grab. Out of this entire bag of stuff, what's your top three things that you think are the most important things to grab in this survival situation? And I'm just going to pull them all out, set them on the table. I'm going to give you about five minutes afterwards, and you're welcome to come up and look at them after they're on the table. If you need to think about it a little more, you can work together if you want to. But here we go. Hat and mittens. That's going to count as one. Is it winter time? It's fall. Oh. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I didn't say that. Plastic water bottle. Snickers. A canteen cup, a ferro rod, hmm, a walkie-talkie, a cell phone, a first aid kit, a tarp, a wool coat, a down sleeping bag, a wool sweater, a rain jacket, an emergency survival blanket, map and compass, paracord, liquor, <laughs> a leatherman, a lighter, wool blanket, a Swiss army knife, a survival kit, you don't know what's in it, steel wool. Okay, you got five minutes. You're welcome to come up and look at this stuff if you'd like again. I'll lay some of it out over here too. I want your top three things, and I want to know why. Okay, the plane just burst into flames. Time's up. All right. So who would like to volunteer their top three items? Um, nice and loud. The first one's kind of okay, so you chose the coat and the canteen and what else? Uh, the fire starter thing. Okay, very good. What about you? I picked the fire starter and a survival kit because most likely a lightly survival kit would have band-aids and everything mm -hmm. that stuff because it's a survival kit. And a map and compass, but I don't really think a map 
would be useful because you don't know what the map would show you because it might show somewhere else. Right. Good idea. Probably already going to have a coat be it in the fall. Yeah. Maybe. Good idea. Good. Thank you. Go ahead. You're saying you would pick that or you wouldn't? Oh, that would definitely be my first choice. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? I had a good time because you could wrap up in it and you can catch water with it. It's shelter. Which number was that for you? Uh, two. What was your other choices? Fire starter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm thinking about the cup. Yeah. Okay. Good. You right there. All right. So I got the tarp, the canteen, and the fair rod. Because the tarp, you make covering with water. The canteen, because like, as long as there's water in the canteen, you can put it in the fire and it won't melt. Good, good. Go ahead, sir. Uh, the fire starter, the tarp, and the cord. The paracord. Okay. Way in the back. Flint, the fire, the cup, and knife. Knife. Yes. <laughs> yes. I agree. But I told you to prioritize if you only had three through top three. Go ahead. Um, map, I chose the mapper, compass, the coat, and the first aid bag. Good. Okay. We'll take one more. Map, compass, water bottle, and first aid kit. Map, compass, water bottle, and first aid kit. Okay. I'm impressed, you guys. You know, you're thinking things through already, like, there's so many things to think about in a survival situation. Um, we're going right into like stuff right away that you're going to need to survive. What are the top three concerns we have right off the bat in a survival situation? What's one? Shelter. Shelter. What's another one? Uh, if anybody's injured. Yes. Water. After that, we have shelter, then? Hydration, water. Water, and there's one more really big one. Fire. What do you think, honey? Not before food. We need something else before food. What do you think? Fire. Yeah, we need a fire. So fire, water, and shelter are the immediates. And of course, the people that are injured. Yeah, yeah you definitely have to take care of the people who are injured. And, and then there's the whole mental game. And I'll talk about that later. Let's dig into these items. I'm just going to kind of roll through them really quick. We'll do some pros and cons on each of them. Um, the canteen was something that came up a lot, and, and you definitely need something to get water. So this is a huge deal, and what else can you do with this because it's metal? Put it on the fire. Yeah, you could cook in here. You could cook some minnows that you caught in a bottle trap or grasshoppers or anything. And you, you could collect, you know, berries. You, you could do a lot with a cup. So that's a good choice. Um, did anybody choose a survival blanket? That was on the list. This can be helpful. I mean, this, these things actually work pretty good. If you have an injured person, a lot of times they're going to be hypothermic. You might need to wrap an injured person in something like this to help keep them alive. So that might be an issue. Uh, map and compass. What if you don't know where you are? Is this going to be helpful? I mean, if you are really intimate with the area that you're flying and you've got stranded in, maybe, but you don't know where you are. So as a survival pick, I probably would wait on this one. What about the walkie-talkie? No. You don't know if this thing even works. And you only got one. You don't know which frequency. This might be just a problem. Leatherman? That's a great tool. Uh, I took one of these on a loan, season five, instead of a knife. And um, I loved my choice. I miss my knife, but this thing could do so many things. This has a little mini saw in it. It has many knives. It's got two knives. It's got the pliers, um, which has, has a cutting tool on it. So I really enjoyed my Leatherman. So they're definitely great. But some kind of a cutting tool would be great. But again, your real priority is fire, water, shelter. How about the liquor? No. 
This is going to only deaden things for a short amount of time. What, what, yeah. what else does liquor do to you? It dehydrates you, so this is a bad idea. And then you think, well, what about the guy that's hurt? Well, it's still going to wear off, and he's going to be back in pain. So that, and you know what else? If it gets really cold, like below freezing, alcohol doesn't freeze. And you can actually ingest, like in Alaska where I live, if you take some liquor and drink it in the middle of winter and it's like 20, 30 below, and this was, you can freeze your throat, actually, because this doesn't freeze. So this could probably do more harm than good. Not a good idea. Snickers. No. Yeah. <laughs> of course, in a survival situation, you wish you had a million Snickers. But food is not your first priority or your second or your third even. It's way down the line. Um, when we're on the show, uh, if you're not familiar with a loan, they drop you into the wilderness with 10 items to survive as long as you can. You need to live off the land. You don't take any food. And what, ha what ends up happening is if you were to get just a little bit of food, it kind of gets your system going again, and it makes you actually more hungry. So if you were just to have a little something, especially something as sugary and delicious as a Snickers bar, it's really going to get your body going again, as opposed to when you're just empty, you kind of lose that feeling of, wanting, of hunger. So it's just an interesting physiology thing that happens with your body. So it's almost better not to have any food than to just have a little bit. Plus, remember? There's two other people with you. Now you got to split that thing up or hide it and eat it in the middle of the night. <laughs> so food's not an issue. You can live a long, long time without food. And if you've watched the show, you've seen people absolutely starve. I did it myself. You can go weeks and weeks and weeks, even at my size, without food and with very little food. You know, it took me seven weeks to lose about 28 pounds and get down to 97 pounds on season four. And I was eating little pieces of fish every day. So that's just pure protein diet. But I was still alive. Like I was really on the verge of starting to do some organ damage. That's why I had to go. But you can go so long. And if you're a more padded person, you're carrying your own survival kit right here, <laughs> you're good to go for much longer. <laughs> what about the phone? No. No. Probably not. It might even be dead. It, 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 I talked about it being fall, so it's going to be cold. And you know what happens to batteries? They just go. But um, you, you probably aren't going to need your cell phone. Hat and mittens. This is pretty nice. I mean, heck, this is really nice. But not exactly. If, if you have a ferrule rod, which a lot of you chose, you know, you can stay real close to the fire and you can build a shelter with a tarp. What else can you do with this? Catch water, right? It's a great water catchment. So if you chose like these three things, I mean, because if you're only doing three, I mean, it's hard to just choose three. I might go with this or, or I might go with this. It's toss up. This this uh, down bag would be really nice, but there's three of you, so this would be better for multi people surviving, right? You can all huddle together, you can all take a drink, and you can all have a fire. So that's that. Uh, this is great. Having a container in a survival situation for water is just like ah! when I was in Mongolia, I had no container, and. I found a river, a bottle. I should have brought it. I found a bottle on the side of the river. They were totally in the middle of nowhere, but you know, stuff floats, floats down the river. I was like, thank you, Lord. I have something to actually drink out of. So these are great, but this is better because you can put it in the fire. Um, again, another like Swiss Army knife. Great tools here. Great cutting tool. It's great to have a cutting tool. But maybe there's one in the survival box, and there is. There's a tiny little, there's all kinds of stuff in here that you don't really know what it might be. There's a whistle, um, there's a little cutting tool, some matches, a couple band-aids. This is one that just comes right out of like Walmart. I just grabbed it 
for an example. Um, so and it's got a candle, so you could light a little candle and get a fire started. You know, it's got a couple of the things you need right there in one item. But you're rolling the dice because you don't know what's in there. Uh, first aid kit is great. You know, if you got injured people, you're going to need something. But there's always tearing off of your clothes to, uh, to um, bandage people up. I pretty much, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So I love the down sleeping bag. Um, I love the, uh, the coat. It's a great choice. Why? You mentioned it. True. What else is great about this? Wool stays warm even when it's wet. Yeah, wool stays warm even when it's wet. And what else is great about this coat? No, it's actually not very flammable. Wool doesn't burn very good, which is actually a good thing in a survival situation. You can get really close to the fire. Yes, this is not a color found in nature. This sticks out like crazy. And that would be the only other reason I would have chosen this, because this is so, so bright. You want to be found. So with a good smoke signal fire, a great um, signal color like this, oh man, somebody flying over. I mean, if you didn't have a tarp, this is really great for keeping you dry too. I mean, being dry is such a huge, huge deal. You have to stay dry, because as soon as you get wet, it's just going to it, it's just going to take it right out of your body and you're going to shiver, hypothermia, and everything goes downhill from there. You don't want to drink water. It's just a bad situation. Vancouver Island, alone season four and two and one. Oh, they are brutal. Vancouver Island being a rainforest at the end of the year is so hard. Wool sweater, again, great. I love my wool sweaters, but you got to prioritize the heat, water, uh, fire, water, and shelter. Paracord is awesome. If you're not familiar with paracord, which is this orange stuff, not the other stuff, um, it's full of it's full of other strands. So if you pull it apart, now you've got all these micro strands to work with, right? So you can uh, make a net. You can you know you have seven times the length of cordage as you did. It's not going to be as strong. But you know, cordage, paracord is great for building things, for building your shelter. Wool blanket, I mean, it's great. So, but we're prioritizing fire, water, shelter. <clears throat> How many of you are familiar with a feral rod and what, it, what they are and what they, what they do? Um, there are several different types on the show. Uh, we took one that was this big. The bigger they are, the easier they are to use. And all it is is it's a, it's a man-made metal that is, produces sparks from the heat of a strike. So it just puts out a lot of really good um, sparks. Sometimes you get a knife and you have littler ones. And you always use the back of your knife. Use your spine so you don't wreck your blade. And again, you just get really good sparks. The hard thing is... I like to tell people it's a philosophy of basically you need to light dust on fire when you're using a spark. So you have to process the material down enough that a spark will catch it on fire, which can be really difficult, like in a rainforest or other places that are really wet. So there's some little things I'm going to teach you tonight to help you kind of find those materials that you can start with a spark, because it's really fun. It's just really fun to do that. But as always, and, and you need to start thinking like a survivor because every time you go on a walk, every time you go on a plane, especially if you're going remote, uh, every time you're going hunting, let's say you're even with a group of people, maybe even a guide, and you think, they got it all taken care of. They have everything I need. They're, in, they're keeping me safe. That's a dangerous mentality because you're counting on somebody else to keep you safe. So your first line of defense is on your person. What kind of clothes do you have on? 
What's in your pockets? What's on your belt? How have you prepared yourself for self-rescue? That's really important. So first line of defense, I always have a knife on my belt if I'm going somewhere. Or like you can't do this on an airline. Uh, but in Bush, Alaska, you can have all kinds of crap in your pocket and on your belt. That's pretty common. They're not patting you down and going, put the knife away, especially on a bush flight. And that's where you're probably going to get into trouble, is on a bush flight. So what's in your pockets? What's in on your clothes? What are you wearing? So wool is great, you know? Um, everything to think about is, is how can I self-rescue? So, and the other thing I always keep in my pocket is a cotton ball. Um, someone mentioned that uh, the first aid kit might have some good stuff in it, too, and that's true. You might even find cotton balls in a first aid kit. But what is cotton? It's so flammable. 100% cotton is really flammable, and it doesn't weigh anything. So if I was to take my ferro rod and want to start a fire with a piece of cotton with a spark, do you think I can do it? Yeah, really, really easy. That's instant fire, but, but it's not going to last very long. I'm going to get about 15 to 20 seconds of burn time out of that. Now, is that very much time to get your fire going, especially in a difficult situation? It's not. So the other thing I carry in case I need it, I need a prolonged fire, is another cotton ball. <coughs> And you want to open it up like a nice little fluffy cloud. And we're going to try this again. But this time, I also have an alcohol prep pad in my pocket. So I'm going to open that up, and I'm going to saturate my cotton ball with the alcohol pad. Now, is alcohol flammable? Oh, yeah. Yep. Now, with the added alcohol pad, I'm going to have about a minute and a half of burn time. It's a lot better for something in your pocket that doesn't weigh anything. You won't even know it's there. Put them in every pocket you have of outdoor coat. Put them in your backpacks. Put them in your pockets. And you at least have this. Of course, if you have a lighter, this is great with a lighter, too. But when you're starting to think about ferro rod fires, where it's just a spark, You've got to think about material that you can light with a spark. So this is really good. Goodness, I'm a hot mess. OK, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to let that burn. I think that's a metal table. So there's all kinds of ferro rods on the market. We got this big one on eBay, and then we made the striker with a piece of steel. Um, you can find stuff that looks like this in the sporting goods stores. These are ferro rods with also um, <clears throat> magnesium. So the sparker side is the steel. Then the other side is a flammable metal. And if you shave off some shavings, that's flammable too. Um, you know, any survival place is going to have different types of, you know, there's different sizes, there's different strikers. Um, this one has a whistle with it. Um, but if you really want to learn and get good with it, get one of these big honkers. These are really fun. I make survival necklaces. Oh. So there's a tiny little ferro rod on my necklace with a tiny little ceramic striker. And I can wear this when I'm out, and I'm always going to have fire. And the smaller it is, the harder it is to get a spark, but it still works. So you can look boho chic, <laughs> but really, you're a secret survivalist. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of fun. Uh, around here, actually, when I was on the show in Vancouver, fire was really, really, really hard. And I didn't even try for fire until day four, 
because I was so busy. I was so consumed with building a shelter. I was in land that was bears and, and uh, cougars and wolves. And I wanted a sturdy shelter. So I was just banging away a really sturdy shelter. So then I calmed down. I got what I wanted. I think it's time for fire on day four. Everything is so, so, so wet. I mean, years and centuries and decades wet. Uh, so it was really hard. So what I did was there was all kinds of these big spruce. And, you know, you look for the pitch. Pitch is like gold. You know, you, you can smell it. You know when you find it. It's very resiny, very smells like turpentine. One of my favorite smells in the world. I love this smell. So I, I got some of this. And I, ha I found a shell on the beach like this. Because <clears throat> remember, I don't have a bowl. I don't have anything. And then um, cedar bark. In Vancouver Island, there's lots of cedar bark. And when you strip off the cedar and you take your knife, you can fray this stuff up really nice and fine. I'm sorry, I'm making a mess. Um, and it gets to be like, you know, fuzz. And remember, all I have is a ferro rod. So if you scrape it up, you get this nice, tiny fuzz here that will light with a spark. So I initially used that, and it took me hours. Because then you've got to gather all the other stuff that's going to burn with it, right? So this is only the beginning. Once you get something actually burning, you're like, oh, oh, OK, yeah, OK, what's next? You know, you got to have all this stuff ready, or it's going to be gone. Um, so it's exciting, and it's very tense. And I got it going, and I was like, yes. And also, I always, you know, you get to bring a shemog, which are these things right here. You might see a lot of people wear these. So these are just great. And I wear it like this, and I'm having such a hard time with fire. And I look down. This is cotton. It's got some loose fibers. I'll, well, actually, let me show you what happened. See something missing there? <laughs> I thought, this is going to help me start a fire. And so I pulled apart these fibers until I had just single cotton strands. So with that and my cedar bark, I got my first fire. I'm not going to lie. I used part of my cotton clothes. And you got to do whatever you got to do to make it work, right? That's, that's what you do. And uh, I was so excited. And the next day, my fire was out. So it's like, OK, I got to do this all over again. And it's day five, I didn't get another fire. Whole day, no fire. Try, 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 no fire. Even after success on day four. Day six comes, OK, I'm getting a fire. And I got a fire, and I didn't let that fire go out for like 20 days. I slept by that fire. It was like my child. I slept by the fire. How are you doing OK? <laughs> I'd pet it and feed it and <laughs> rock it. I slept by it with one eye open, and I'd be putting stuff on it to keep it going. That fire was not going to get out the next time. But after I had a fire, I took that shell, and I took some pitch, and I took some shredded bark, which once you shred it, ends up looking like this. And I put the pitch in the shell, and I put it in the fire. And I had a little stick. And I had my shredded bark all ready to go. And I'd melt it, and I'd take a little stick, and I'd mix it in. And that gave me fire starter for the rest of the entire season that I could use every day to start to make my fires. And so we would just have, we would just have uh, the fire starting stuff right there by the fire. And just it was always available. And if it was like, Never going to get damp. If, if you have potential good fire starting stuff like that and it starts to get like rainy and damp, put it in your pockets. Sleep with it and it'll dry it out. And then it'll be super dry for you to use. So that was super awesome. In Mongolia, I had birch bark. And birch bark is like the best thing for starting fires. Uh, and we had a lot of it. So fire was really, really easy in Mongolia. And we have a lot of birch bark here in Michigan. So you can take your knife, and if you get this nice and flat and a good flat surface, again, you can, you can scrape shavings 
on the birch bark, which are extremely flammable. I mean, birch bark is my number one go-to fire starter in the woods if I can't. Above everything else, I will always go for birch bark. It's so easy. And then when you get that lit, you just throw more birch bark on. It's like whoosh. This stuff will burn even when it's wet, and it's just wonderful. So here in, uh, in Alaska and Michigan, this is like my, this is where I make my fire starter. I go out into the woods and I find pitch, and then I process my cedar, and I put it on the wood stove, and I've got a stick, and the house smells so good while I'm cooking my fire starter. And it's just wonderful. And I'm actually, I actually sell my fire starter, and I will have some back there tonight. So it is my like special secret recipe. But I guess it's not secret anymore. <laughs> the other good thing you can do is find fat wood. And fat wood is wood that you'll find in trees that are uh, like pine trees and stuff. A lot of times branches will break off or, or things. And if you look, you look at the branch and, and you break it off and smell it right where it was attached to the tree, you can smell that resin. And you can take your knife and scrape some of that off. And it's just wonderful to smell and there's no doubt that that is just soaked and saturated with pitch and you can use those in fires and it's really good you guys can pass pass this around and smell it um, they just smell so good what am i doing on time i'm going to talk about clothes again really quick i always wear like a bandana like on my wrist or something because they're just so handy for so many things um, Filtering water, I guess if you needed to filter out some really big particles, you could run some water through here first. It's not going to get jarty and all that other stuff, but it might, if you come across a creek or something and you're really desperate, I mean, it's always good to boil your water, but if you are so dehydrated that you can't stand it, drink out of the freaking creek, right? It's not going to kill you immediately. <laughs> Hopefully you get out first. <laughs> run it through this first. What else is good about this? Yeah, red. Uh, I love leather gloves. I don't do anything without leather gloves. It protects your hands when you're working with your knife. Uh, a lot of times in pine forests, you're breaking off the small stuff, and it's just really sharp, and you can get cuts. And, and when you're working with the fire, and you've got your cup, and it's just so handy to work in gloves. And that's just my personal preference. I'm Melissa, I'm from the Cedar Springs Library. And I'm Donna Clark, I'm the director of the Cedar Springs Library, and boy did we have a night tonight. Yes, Brooke Whipple actually came to our library and did an amazing presentation and did a survival simulation for, we had 84 people that attended. And she was very entertaining. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared that she was going to be so, I think it's the passion and the love for what she does that just comes out, seeps out of every pore, and then she's acting, and her eyes are sparkling, and it just drew all of us in. Everyone had a smile on their face at the end and wanted her to come back and do more programs in the future with us. We were so impressed with Brooke. We loved it. We love you, Brooke. Thank you so much, Brooke.